Uh, good morning. Uh, we welcome all of you to the Ford School of Management, New Delhi, and to Ford International Marketing Conference 2021, delving deep into the theme marketing in a disrupted world. I have with uh, me uh, Professor Ansh Gupta, the co convener of FIMC 21, and he is the assistant associate professor in Ford School of Management, the marketing area. Good morning, uh, everyone. In this inaugural session, we have the privilege to have a very distinguished panel. We have with us Professor Osama Khan. Professor Osama Khan is the Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Surrey, UK. He has the uh, he was the founding director of Solent Learning and Teaching Institute. Professor Khan holds a professor in practice title at the Surrey Business School. He has 24 years of experience in teaching in various universities, including the University of Surrey, University of Cambridge, Copenhagen Business School, ATC Paris, among others. He is an avid advocate of technology enhanced learning and won multiple awards as an innovative teacher throughout his career. We welcome you, sir. We have with us Professor Prakash Bagri. Professor Prakash Bagri is currently Associate Dean, Corporate Engagements and Clinical Associate Professor of Marketing at the Indian School of Business. Professor Bagri uh, has brings three decades of experience across industry and academia, which includes senior leadership positions in Unilever and Intel. His last corporate role was as Chief Marketing Officer for Intel, South Asia. Professor uh, Bagri has also been adjunct faculty at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Calcutta. Professor Bagri is the recipient of the prestigious Intel Achievement Award in 2005, was featured as brand boss in the Economic Times in 2009, and recognized by the World Brand Congress with the Outstanding Marketing Professional Award in 2009. We welcome you, sir. We have with us Mr. Falk Saham, Mr. Falk is the executive director at Shanghai Hulu Business Consulting Company. He is an award-winning creative strategist with more than 20 years of experience in growing businesses, building strategy teams, and developing uh, connected marketing, brand, and communication strategies of local, regional, global scale. We welcome you, sir. We have with us uh, Professor Madhukar. I think is not yet joined. Uh, He'll be joining. He'll be joining. Okay. Okay. So we have with us uh, Professor Vinayashil Gautam, FRS London. Professor Gautam is the vice chairman of Ford School of Management, New Delhi. He was the founder director of Indian Institute of Management, Kojikur, and also served as the emeritus chair professor at IIT Delhi. We welcome you, sir. Uh, we have with us Dr. Jitendra Das, director Ford School of Management, New Delhi. He has been a professor of marketing and the founder dean Noida campus of IIM Lucknow. He has been a consultant to the World Bank, IDRC Canada, and other many leading organizations. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. As we begin uh, with the panel, we are just still waiting for uh, Dr. Madhukar, uh, who will be joining in brief time. As we begin with this panel at the Ford International Marketing Conference, I would give a brief introductory remark and will then proceed with the sessions. As governments gradually remove pandemic induced restrictions and businesses begin to reopen, there is a sense that we might be on the verge of returning to normal. And this is unlikely. During the months of lockdown and self isolation, we have been, in fact, writing new future. This has uh, important implications for marketers trying to build lasting relationships with customers. Granular monitoring of data is signaling a disruptive alteration in the trend of consumer behavior. Given the unprecedented nature of the pandemic and the profound changes it has caused, and also currently also it's causing, we believe that harnessing imagination is extremely critical. Marketers need to think hard and think differently about the customers in the next normal because they will think, feel, say, and do. We have observed some potential important changes in consumer behavior. For example, consumers halted five years in the adoption of digital in just eight weeks. 
significant cohorts of them have been trying digital for the first time. In a study, it has been seen that in Latin America, 13 million people made their first ever e-commerce transaction during COVID-19 pandemic. And across all countries measured in the McKinsey Global Consumer Sentiment Surveys, consumers are, it has been found that consumers are turning to digital and reduced contact ways of accessing products and services. Further, in the last two years, we have seen increasing degree of e-services adoption from banking to telemedicine. People are now adopting e-services significantly and businesses are opening up. The crisis has made the home a multifunctional hub, a place where people live, work, learn, shop, and and play. This will be especially true as a growing number of global organizations and employees attempt to sustain some of the advantages of working remotely, and they have now experienced. So in the last two years, the world has changed and so has the business, so has the consumers. Marketing is also going through a process of change in this disrupted world. In the backdrop, Ford School of Management, New Delhi, is organizing Ford International Marketing Conference. And we have kept our theme as marketing in a disrupted world. We have 43 research papers across six tracks, which will be presented uh, at the conference in the next two days. Eminent scholars and practitioners will exchange their ideas and thoughts how marketing can negotiate the challenging caused by the disruptive environment. I thank you all, rather we thank you all uh, for your attention and welcome you all to the conference. Now I take the opportunity to invite Dr. Jitin to thus the conference chair and the director of Hospital management to deliver the welcome address. Over to Dr. Das. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nirmalya Bandupadhyay. Uh, Professor Osama Khan who is the Pro Vice Chancellor and Professor of Practice at the University of Surrey, UK. Uh, Professor Prakash Bagri, who is the Associate Dean, Corporate Engagements and Clinical Associate Professor of Marketing at the Indian School of uh, Business, Hyderabad. Uh, Mr. Falk Foreman, Executive Director, Shanghai Hule Business Consulting Company, China. Dr. Vinayshil Gautam, who is the Vice Char Chairman of Ford School Management and ex Emeritus Chair Professor at IIT Delhi and the Founder Director in Music Board. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, BBL Madhukar, who is the Director General of uh, BRICS Chamber of Commerce and Industries and the Chairman of the uh, Ford School of uh, Management. Uh, Professor Nirmal Bundupada, who is the convener of this uh, conference. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor uh, Ansh Gupta, who is the conference uh, co convener uh, members of the uh, faculty, research scholars, uh, students, uh, members of the uh, media, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon uh, to you all. It is my proud privilege and with a sense of gratitude that I welcome you all to this uh, inaugural session of the four International Marketing Conference 2021. It is a two day uh, event and the conference is themed on marketing in a disrupted world. Uh, this is our 10th in the series of international conferences that we organize every year. Uh, the first one was held in year 2012. And this is our 10th international uh, conference since uh, 2020. That is last year uh, and this being the second such year. We are holding this uh, conference uh, in the online mode. Uh, earlier, it used to be in a physical mode and uh, uh, dignitaries and participants uh, from international locations as well would travel to uh, Delhi and uh, uh, grace our uh, conference with their uh, uh, presence and uh, wisdom and participation in the uh, deliberations. The, uh, uh, the, the online essentially has been happening now. Uh, primarily because of the COVID-19 pandemic induced uh, safety measures and we all, all go by that. I would also like to uh, uh, welcome uh, the uh, professors and uh, uh, eminent uh, uh, researchers who have agreed to be with us uh, in this conference and to share their wisdom through the panel discussion as well as sharing the technical session that we have scheduled today and, and tomorrow. I would like to welcome Dr. Saikat Banerjee. He's the professor of marketing at IIFT. Uh, I would also like to welcome Professor Amit Mukherjee, who is the professor 
at Delhi Technological University, New Delhi. I would also like to welcome Dr. Pooja Kushwaha. She is the Associate Professor at Jaipuria Institute of Management uh, in Bor. I would also like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Rupal Walia Sharma. She is a Professor of Marketing at uh, SPJN uh, 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 Management Research Institute. Uh, I would also like to welcome Professor Sat Bhushan Das, who is a professor at uh, uh, IIM uh, Lucknow. Uh, and then the five panel members for the panel discussion uh, scheduled tomorrow, namely uh, Mr. Chenis Jacob, is the general manager of Movoto Group uh, Europe and Southeast Asia. Mr. Kapil Grover, the chief marketing and digital officer at Burger King India. Mr. Kush Mehra, he is the CBO of Pine Labs India. Mr. Sangram Sinha is a commercial director, Pemod Ricard Asia, uh, Seagram's Myanmar unit. Uh, Dr. Nancy Richmond, uh, she is the assistant teaching professor at Florida University in USA. I would also like to welcome Dr. Bhardwaj Sivakamaran, who is a professor at Great Lakes Institute of uh, uh, Management. Uh, and also Dr. Gautam Dutta, who is a professor at IFT Kolkata, as well as Dr. Malika Srivastava, she is the associate professor at Narsi Monji uh, uh, Bangalore. Uh, and uh, in the valedictory section, session on uh, tomorrow, uh, late uh, uh, afternoon, uh, we are very pleased to have uh, uh, Professor Gautam Mahajan. He is the president, Foundation of Customer Value and editor general of Creating Value. Ms. Bhavana Subramanian, she is the Chief Marketing Officer, Randstad India. Mr. Rahul Raizada, who is the Executive Director of uh, Pricewaterhouse. Uh, Professor Mithileshwar Jha, author and ex-professor of marketing at IIM Bangalore. Uh, with these eminent uh, dignitaries uh, joining us, uh, we are feeling really privileged uh, to listen to them uh, during this two-day uh, uh, conference. And I'm sure uh, we will benefit a lot uh, by their uh, uh, words of uh, wisdom. Uh, normally, we do this uh, conference once a year, which is uh, held by one of the uh, nine uh, academic areas uh, at our institute. Uh, this year, that is year 2021, it was decided that the marketing area will uh, uh, take up uh, this international conference lead. And uh, the theme was to be decided. Now, because of the uh, pandemic induced uh, uh, constraints and challenges that we were facing, uh, it was almost instantaneously that we decided to uh, 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 take up this uh, theme, uh, marketing in a disrupted uh, world. This came very naturally to us because uh, one of the most uh, important aspect uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, and lockdown situation uh, was faced by a lot of uh, companies who were uh, uh, facing challenges of uh, uh, you know, restoring their revenues. And marketing is one area which helps you uh, organize yourself to ensure the, 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 the revenues keep coming in and uh, the various aspects of organizational functions continue to operate uh, in a robust uh, uh, fashion. Uh, so this was the very brief background which let's take up this uh, 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 marketing in a disrupted world as the theme, and let's go ahead and, and, and do this uh, particular uh, deliberations around this uh, theme. Uh, myself being a student of uh, marketing, and when you look at uh, the various aspects of business, and especially uh, for marketing professionals, uh, uh, facing challenges is almost uh, like a ongoing process. You always have the uh, challenges all the time. Now, in the business world, we are also familiar with uh, what we call the VUCA world, you know, V-U-C-A, that is uh, volatile, uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous world. This has been in the business domain discussion for, I think, more than a decade now. Uh, but uh, in the marketing, uh, these uh, VUCA world is all the time, especially if you are in the uh, sales unit. Because sales is always under pressure, and you are always uncertain as to uh, what will happen. And uh, so activities are to be done uh, from that perspective. Now come the current time because of the uh, pandemic and things go upside down. But uh, uh, and essentially we say that the market has been disrupted, the business environment has been disrupted. But from the marketing point of view, 
the disruptions have been happening all the time. Uh, it's like, you know, from the uh, dawn of time, uh, there has been disruptions. The new thing comes in, the, the way you reach out to the consumer undergoes a change. Like, for example, when you have the computers, the way you deal with customers in terms of developing a marketing plan would undergo a change. Uh, then you had the smartphones, you got the internet and things started changing. So, so marketing would always be oriented on how do we adapt to the new situation? How do we reconfigure our uh, uh, ways of doing things such that we reach out to the customer in a faster and more efficient way? If you go back in time, uh, then there are umpteen examples of uh, 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 knowing and sharing as to how the marketing professionals and the marketing activities have undergone a change. Uh, from those days where there was no mechanization, no machine, no nothing, even those days to the current times. So the uh, disruption is uh, a routine thing as far as marketing subject domain is concerned, marketing professionals are, are, are concerned. And uh, we keep looking at it now because of the uh, the VUCA world and the, the way technology started coming into the uh, life, uh, people have started talking of uh, disruptions in many ways. And then somebody came up with this uh, idea that these disruptions are actually an opportunity for doing things in a better and faster way. And the term which was uh, coined almost, um, um, I think uh, five, six years ago was disruptive innovation. That means you bring in a new way of handling the disruption that has happened and you capture the market in a more faster and efficient way. The classic example would be the Uber, the Ula, the Oyo, the Airbnb uh, models of uh, doing business. So we call it uh, innovation, but this is a disruptive innovation because it just turns around the way you are doing business. Uh, the way, uh, you know, to begin with, when the Uber came, uh, it hit the, uh, uh, the cab service uh, the way nobody could uh, fathom even, uh, let's say, a day earlier. So that's the disruptive innovation that has... Uh, uh, faced us and uh, people are coming up with their own ways and solutions to look at this. Uh, now this from the marketing point of view essentially means that uh, we have to find a newer way if, of uh, reaching out to the customer. So essentially we need to find out as marketing professional what we call the friction points in the uh, consumer experience. You know the way the goods and services are to be delivered to the uh, consumer we need to find uh, friction points or find where the um, the comforts are less uh, for a consumer and come up uh, with a solution. And these solutions in the current times are in the form of what you call disruptive uh, innovation. So essentially, uh, the job of marketing professional is to make the world uh, more accessible. Uh, and this uh, change is actually also accentuated by what we call the behavioral disruption that is happening in the people. Like for example, as a small example, you know, today uh, people are getting more used to uh, uh, items uh, of any um, purchase getting delivered to your home. Uh, even the services being uh, delivered to your home. Like for example, even the barber service, there are people who would come to your home and do the barber service uh, sitting at your home. So how has this impacted? the uh, market you know for example there are a lot of these uh, shops uh, local shops uh, they are under pressure uh, so uh, uh, the behavioral pattern which is undergoing change in the consumer how does the marketer take note of this and how we reorganize uh, ourselves to ensure that the revenues keep uh, coming in is the challenge uh, today so i'm sure the two day conference that we have we'll be looking at uh, the various issues, concerns, challenges, and opportunities uh, uh, that is uh, uh, available in the, in, the, in, in the environment or the business environment today. Uh, and the uh, panel members and the uh, speakers who would be sharing their views would be a, of great value add uh, from a learning perspective and for practitioners to uh, take out those uh, nuggets of wisdom and implement them for their own uh, uh, good. So with these words, I welcome you all once again to this uh, two-day conference, and I'm sure you'll have uh, a very fruitful time in terms of uh, the online uh, formatted interactions that we will have with each other and learn from each other in terms of uh, uh, how they have done things and how they plan to do things. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for your address. Now, I think uh, we have... Uh... Uh, Mr. Is Fahad Ahmed Khan uh, has joined. Uh, actually, uh, the 
Joint Secretary is not being able to join, and uh, we have now is Mr. Is Fahad Ahmed Khan, who is an IPS of 2014, and he is the Under Secretary of the Ministry of Commerce. He is uh, a, uh, an, an alumni of IIM Bangalore, worked in the banks, I say say bank previously before uh, joining uh, IPS, uh, IFS. Uh, he worked with ICICI Bank London and also CT Bank and the Global Decision Management. Welcome you, uh, sir, uh, here. Uh, I request uh, Mr. Khan, uh, Fahad Ahmed Khan to uh, give a brief address uh, and then we will proceed to the keynote speakers. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, very much. Professor uh, Jitender Das, uh, conference chair, faculty members of Four School of Management, eminent speakers, panelists, participants from industry, academia, and dear students. Good afternoon to all of you, or good morning uh, to uh, some of the people uh, who are joining from other parts of the world. Uh, I am representing uh, Dr. Shrikar Reddy, Joint Secretary uh, FT Vana in Department of Commerce, uh, who is uh, is the meeting has been uh, stretched beyond uh, the initial allotted time. So uh, I'll be uh, reading out his uh, prepared speech on the occasion. So pardon me if uh, you know I sound uh, boring and I don't look uh, directly into the camera while speaking because I'll be reading out a prepared uh, draft. Uh, so it's a great pleasure and an honor to deliver this uh, special address uh, on an extremely relevant topic, uh, which is marketing in the age of disruption. No business has been left untouched uh, by the unprecedented crisis of COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, has not only disrupted uh, the entire world, but it has forced us to completely change the way we think, we operate, we work, and we market our products and services to our customers, as uh, customers' expectations are also changing in the post-COVID world. Uh, and during the, I mean, uh, in the ongoing pandemic, uh, process and also uh, in an expected post-COVID world, it, it remains to be seen uh, how uh, uh, organizations and companies uh, adapt to this highly volatile situation. Uh, we would be reminded of uh, the age-old uh, saying, it will be well of the fittest, and I believe uh, that's what we are going to see now, and that's what we are seeing. And one fundamental char characteristic of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been speed. The virus uh, hit us fast sent much of the world into disruption uh, within months of uh, the first case being detected. Businesses also reacted uh, quite rapidly and, uh, and have adapted to the situation. Our uh, supply chains have been reorganized. Uh, the way we reach out to customers has uh, changed. But now uh, in a post-COVID situation, when we are looking at a, uh, a significant disruption that has already happened and what do we do next? Uh, the important question is, how do we maintain this uh, speed? There is a need for a sustainable speed that needs to be maintained. And for this, companies have to design uh, the framework for maintaining the speed. Uh, you have to uh, redesign your marketing strategies. Well, disruption as a process has always, uh, has always led uh, the more nimble uh, firms and nimble companies uh, to come up with innovative solution, solutions to not only survive, but thrive and uh, take the industry forward to uh, the next frontiers. Uh, and technology has played an important role in this aspect. Uh, a perfect example of, uh, of uh, the use of technology is, is the way small companies like Uber and Ola, I mean, small when at the time when they started out, uh, challenge the global concept of uh, taxi cabs and uh, you know aggregation today is is uh, an accepted norm uh, this has also led to food aggregators like zomato swiggy uh, that we have here which have uh, taken away the exclusivity of eating out and uh, they have made it uh, a regular part of our day to day affairs and many such innovations have disrupted the world well, at the core of this uh, entire approach is, is a simple uh, fundamental aspect of uh, taking, uh, giving customers uh, what they want, putting them at the center and uh, at, the, at the center of our uh, processes and at the cent center of our uh, deliberations on how do we uh, make it more convenient for customer to reach out to the product, uh, to, uh, for the product to reach to the customer, not the other way around, of a customer reaching out for a product. So this phenomenon has uh, touched every business today and emerging technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence have just enhanced this uh, 
uh, the speed of the disruption and the speed of our uh, adaptation uh, to this uh, new reality. And uh, as per uh, certain surveys, uh, the pandemic has just accelerated our digital customer interaction by almost four years in the Asia Pacific region. So now, uh, uh, coming to the central theme, uh, which is which is why we are here, as to how all this is going to impact the way we do marketing. Well, uh, the disruption in the field of marketing is still in its infancy. Uh, sorry, I just noticed. Uh, my joint secretary walking in, uh, but I'll continue and uh, finish uh, the speech. Uh, so the disruption of marketing, as I said, is still in its infancy, but uh, has profoundly changed how brands connect with buyers. This has also forced us to rethink the way we communicate our thoughts and messages to the intended uh, market and uh, targeted audience. So businesses now have the power of AI, uh, which uh, gives more advantages and chances to them to stay ahead uh, of the competition in many different ways. So more and more, more investing in AI marketing uh, uh, is going to probably reshape the future of marketing. AI will not only allow marketers to crunch a huge amount of uh, marketing data analytics in a relatively faster real-time basis, but it also lead to uh, huge cost savings, faster ROI, increasing personalization, smarter and better customer insights for faster decision making. So as I said, speed, has been a fundamental characteristic and it will be a key differentiating factor between organization and marketing successes and failures. So companies uh, and marketing, I mean, especially uh, marketing company, companies that have embraced digital transformation and have already started reaching out to customers based on uh, uh, AI and uh, uh, highly advanced digital tools, they have shown initial successes and and I believe that is uh, that is what is going to happen in the future as well. And there's also a lot of uh, uh, data on how advertisement spends are not uh, now being uh, channeled in the digital space. So, so marketers, uh, I believe, must build a chance of engagement in digital strategy and leverage data to enable more personalized, proactive conversa conversations with their customers. So, change is extremely difficult especially in challenging times, but uh, as I said, disruptions do provide an opportunity for everyone to innovate, thrive, and do the best out of uh, uh, Like to quote, uh, Sir Philip Kotler had once said, markets always change faster than marketing, which is, uh, I guess, which I guess is uh, more relevant uh, today than ever. So with this, uh, I look forward to uh, the rest of the sessions and I thank and compliment all the organizers and extend my best wishes on behalf of Dr. Shrikaradi sir to all the past participants and I believe we we are looking to gain you. Thank you. Have a nice day then. Thank you, Mr. Fahad Ahmed Khan for your address. Now I will uh, go to uh, Professor Osama Khan, our keynote speaker for this session, uh, for his speech. Professor Osama is a proof vice chancellor and professor in practice at University of Surrey, UK, and a very good friend of mine. So over to Osama. Thank you, Osama. Morning, everybody. Uh, uh, namaste and adab. Uh, I am delighted to be here. Um, um, First of all, I would like to say a big thank you and gratitude to Professor Nirmal Bandipatai, a very close friend. We are both fellow Bengalis. And uh, my gratitude to Professor Jitendra Das, the director of Four uh, Management School. And of course, distinguished scholars, it is a, a privilege and a humility for me to be in your presence, uh, distinguished guests, and my beloved students. I, I may not have seen you. Uh, whomever in the call, but I would like to dedicate my uh, um, keynote today to the students who are in the audience. Uh, so let me start what I am going to talk about today. I actually don't have any slides, so it might be a, a sense of relief to some of you, but I have a few points that I would like to share with you. So I will give you a little bit of context where I'm coming from about disruptive technology in management education. 
and what is the transformation agenda there should be for management education uh, after COVID-19. And in fact, I was so delighted to hear some of the very thought provoking data that's already been shared by some of uh, our speakers. Uh, Professor Das was talking about how things have progressed, how things have progressed really rapidly over the last 18 months and how businesses are adopting to fulfill the demand of the customer. And my first question to everybody in the audience is what are we going to do to fulfill the demand of our students? So with that context, I will then go into some of the key disruptive technology I think are going to shake the future of higher education. And if we are not careful, higher education well might face a Kodak moment. And those who are marketeers, all of you are marketeer, you understand what is a Kodak moment means and how to avoid that and evolve. Then I'm going to pose some fundamental questions to all of you, which are the big questions, particularly this is aimed towards senior colleagues like Professor Das, like Professor Banerjee, that when you are running a business school, how do you basically grapple with these fundamental questions in terms of education and disruption in technology? Then I'll cover a little bit about curriculum development. And finally, I will share some of the key ingredients which has helped me as a pro-vice chancellor education and student experience at a British institution. So let's talk about the context. I think we need to accept the fact that a university is nothing but a social constructivist process. A university brings scholars and learners together, and we learn from each other through the fundamental theory, which is very close to my heart, known as the social constructivism. It basically fundamentally means that we learn from interaction. In fact, today, I'm so delighted that I'll be with you and I'll be learning from all of you. And this interaction, of course, would have been better if, I, if I'm with you in New Delhi, but due to the COVID and everything, we are doing it virtually. But this interaction cannot be replaced with anything. You can all send me your recorded lectures. That would be one thing. But having the feeling that you're live with me is something else. And if I could have been together on four School of Management campus, that would have been excellent. So I think we need to appreciate the fact that as human beings, we learn from each other by interacting with each other. So that's one context. The other context, I will also say that everything today I will share with you from my little wisdom that I have gathered over 24 years of management education is public education and private education or marketized education. So whichever sector you are in, whether you are running a public institution where education is a privilege and it's delivered at uh, no cost, or whether education is a marketized mechanism like in Britain, where every student has to pay nearly 10,000 pound a year to get their free their education from the public institution. So are the students coming to get the support by paying or are the student came here because it's a privilege they fought really hard in the admission test and they got into the school. So that's another context. The other thing I would also talk about is technology at scale. We I'm not going to dazzle you with anything new. In fact, you might get disappointed if you're waiting for me to show you the dazzling technology. There is nothing dazzling I'm going to show you. But the question is, how do you do things at scale? There, there, every management school in the world, there are innovative professors who teach really well. And I'm sure Professor Das knows those colleagues within the four management school. But how do you do that at scale where every professor within the management education are doing something innovative for our students. The other thing I will also talk about, what is the space, the physical space of an education provision and what does it mean in the virtual space and how do we blend them together? Another context is the whole philosophy of education in the history of human civilization came from the prophetic disciple model, more like the guru shishya model. And then it transformed to professor student model, which is predominantly what exists now. But I propose unless we move to a facilitator learner model, we will not be able to survive. So the sage on the stage has to stop, in my humble opinion. And finally, generation gap. Now, it's a, it's a tough reality that every year we are getting older. When I started my academic career, I was 25. I almost felt like I'm a big brother of my students. 
Now I feel like I'm their dad. And in a few years time, I will feel like I'm their granddad. But the question is, there is a generation gap. And what are we doing as management educator and the leaders of education to upskill our very talented and scholarly professors to keep up with the generation gap? What are the generation Zs and alphas are thinking? Because if I reflect on how I studied back in Bangladesh, back at Cambridge, management education, then I cannot really teach well because the context has completely shifted. So let's move on to disruptive tech. So those are my contexts that based on which I'm going to talk about a few disruption. I think the biggest disruption is our students are digital natives. They roam around in social media. I cannot even name number of social media they go through. Sometimes things come up and I, I never even heard about them, but that's apparently the most trendy thing. Like literally two weeks ago, I figured that my two teenage kids are constantly on Discord. This is the first time I heard about Discord. Now that probably shows my age as well. But the fact is Instagram, Discord, so uh, Facebook. In fact, Facebook is no longer trendy, you probably know. So as a matter of fact, they're digital native. Students or our learners are getting into gaming. They immerse themselves into gaming with augmented reality and virtual reality with Oculus lenses, and they immerse themselves to play a game collectively, and sometimes hours and days pass by, and they don't even switch off. When was the last time one of the management students in our schools have immersed themselves in my lecture and didn't, they didn't stop? I think they stopped pretty much within 10 minutes of start, start getting into the lecture. So the question needs to be asked that when the world is progressing in such a way where learners are learning through immersive experience, why are they going to come to us for education? So that's another challenge. The other challenge is automation, artificial intelligence, big data and analytics. What are we doing about it? Everybody is wearing an Apple Watch or a Fitbit nowadays, which is tapping on my uh, uh, wrist every now and then saying, Selma, you need to stand up. You have been sitting down for a long. Selma, you need to walk because you haven't walked today. So when was the time when we are going to tap onto the wrist of our students to say that you haven't finished the reading list Professor Das said for you? You haven't finished the assessment that uh, Nirmal Banerjee have said for you. When are we going to do those artificial intelligence? And it is time for us to utilize those artificial intelligence within the ethics of usage. And finally, in terms of disruption, what I would say is virtual learning environment, something that we probably have or don't have. I'm sure four management schools have a thriving virtual learning environment or a learning management system. Are we using that as a cloud repository of PowerPoint slides that I had prepared for every of my lecture? Or are we actually using virtual learning environment as a social media? So this is a call out to technology companies as well as to our very scholarly uh, innovative academics that call out for a virtual learning environment that looks like a Discord, that looks like Instagram, that feels like social media so that the immersion can happen. Why the virtual learning environment is on our screen? Why cannot be that within the, uh, uh, the Oculus lens or within the augmented reality and virtual reality? So those are the, some of the technology that is going to disrupt us. They are already there. They are in the commercial sector and the consumer sector absolutely prolific, uh, in a prolific way uh, progressing, but when are they going to enter the higher education? So here are my fundamental question. The first question you may not like, because many of my academics, one and a half thousand at the University of Surrey, don't like every time I ask this question. Are our students customers? It's a very slippery slope to climb. Now, I always say that no, the students are not customer, but they came here for a service provision. It's like a gym membership. You have the facility, you have the facilitator, you have to put in your work to lose the weight, to gain the muscle. So we need to think of our students in that way. And if we struggle to think of our students that way, the, all the conf conference ingredients that we'll be discussing in this conference about how the customers are demanding things, on-demand things are getting served into their home, when are, the, when are those things going to happen for our students and learners? So a few fundamental questions. Are students customer or are, are we actually giving them a service? If we do, why aren't we behaving like the commercial entities? And I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion in scholarly paper on those to, in this conference. 
what is the future of lecture? What is really the future of lecture? We all know from the cognitive scientists that within about 17 minutes, uh, uh, healthy adults stop concentrating. What is the length of our lectures? Our lectures are two hours, three hours, sometimes even longer. So the question is, should the lecture be replaced with on demand or flexibility that they can zoom in, they can log in, or they can turn up? It's their choice. How about the future of lab workshop tutorial? Should we be using augmented reality and virtual reality to support them, or should we be forcing them to come to our tutorials? And finally, what is really the value of examination? In fact, ask yourself, if you're a professor in this call, when was the last time you sat an examination? So what does an examination really give as a life skill? To my humble opinion, nothing. So what is the, what is the purpose of timed invigilated assessment? Throughout the entire pandemic over the last 20 months, I was bombarded by technology company to talk about uh, exam security. So the question is, you know, why exam security is such an important thing? Why can't we trust our students, give them a complex real life problem to solve? So let's talk about authentic assessment and move away from invigilated exam. Finally, two final points, curriculum development. There is a lot of innovation happening in our management education among MBAs and executive MBA. I know that they're the premium product. They pay a lot of money and we give them a very immersive experience. What happened to the hundreds and thousands of undergraduate students we have in our management school? Why do we give them a very traditional education? So I welcome everybody to think about management education from the EMBA style and innovate at the undergraduate level as well. Let's think of a stackable uh, curriculum, a curriculum where you can take one course, go away, do your job, come back, do another course, and over time, maybe over 10 years, you do your undergraduate. Why that is not possible? because some of our young minds are wants to get into the world of work. Let them and let them come back. And how can we do that? Finally, my final point to the leaders of the School of Management, so the leaders of higher education, how do you promote this student voice, student-centric curriculum with technology that weaves into that curriculum and provide flexibility to our students? A few tips from my knowledge and experience as a pro vice chancellor. Reward good performance in teaching. When was the last time you promoted a professor because he or she was outstanding in teaching? Maybe not that good at research. Be brave to reward teaching equally to research. And if you're not, teaching will not have innovation. And finally, I would say that program management is a very important part. So make sure within your program, you use technology to bring learners of different world together. So not just guest lecture, but also uh, uh, bringing students together, giving them a life problem and solving them together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Khan, for this insightful address. A lot of questions has been posed by him and a lot of things uh, to think of. So I uh, would like to go uh, to uh, Professor Lokash Bagri, Associate Dean, Corporate Engagements and Clinical Associate Professor of Marketing, Indian School of Business Hyderabad for his keynote address. Over to Professor Balk. Good morning, and thank you, Professor Bandapadhyay, uh, for uh, asking me to come and share some thoughts with you. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning to Dr. Das, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, and representing him, uh, Mr. Khan, as well as Professor uh, Khan himself, uh, and the rest of the distinguished panelists. I, when I first looked at the title uh, of, of uh, the seminar, which was marketing in a disruptive, uh, disrupted world, uh, I was sure uh, there would be a lot of discussions in terms of how we are amidst disruption. And that's been a significant part of the theme from the morning itself. I think Professor Khan also talked about it. Uh, Dr. Das also talked about the uh, space of disruption that we are in. But I thought uh, it would be useful to kind of give uh, another perspective to it and to share with you why I came up with this perspective. Recently, I was uh, called on to address uh, a group of uh, the top CMOs in India. Perhaps they called me because uh, having been a CMO myself a decade ago and now having been 
a strategy and marketing practitioner uh, as well as uh, academic, what were the perspectives I had? So I was kind of taking them through uh, the evolution of marketing and the role. And then we were in the Q&A session towards the end. And one of the CMOs basically asked me, what do you think is our relevance now? And I was a bit taken aback by the question. But then as I started looking into it, this is not a new question which has been asked in the recent years or something which has got accelerated because of COVID. This has been a part and parcel of our discussion across businesses for the better part of the last few decades. And in order to understand it, why it has come front and center stage is perhaps a few events or occurrences around us. You know, most of us uh, have grown up to the era when as marketeers ourselves, we used to talk about John Wanamaker's statement about, yeah, we all know half of the marketing uh, and specifically the advertising budget is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which is the bet half which is being wasted. And then you had Do David Ogilvy, who said, I know it better than the rest of you. And that was the era of the marketing men in terms of the ones who could advertise. And again, for those of you who are closer to my peers, you would understand the era of Don Draper, the madman. You know, you, you had to go and pump flesh, you had to play golf, you had to have, you had to wine and dine your customers, and they would give us great business. However, we have seen a major transition. And this transition has been amplified by a few books, which talks about how the advertising industry itself has got disrupted. And in fact, the world's biggest marketeers today, the two biggest were all called, and the New Yorker kind of identified it, when the top tech companies were called to the congressional hearing. And the big title came in that how the math men are overthrowing the madmen era of the past. But what I want to submit is that it's not just the outreach or communicating to consumers or customers, which is being impacted by the, by the influx of data and, and, and uh, digital technologies. If you really look at it, marketing as a function is getting narrower and narrower. And that's because as far as innovation is concerned, we are getting into ethnography, we are getting into research and development, as far as clear, clarifying the business value proposition for the customers is concerned, that's slowly getting into the domain of strategy. Product design itself is where R&D and engineering are working closely together. Pricing is something where the talk is, shouldn't finance be owning it up? Shouldn't we be able to do real-time dynamic pricing, which then goes somewhere into the annals of information technology, web design, as well as what the financial department is talking about. Even the whole concept of supply chain and distribution is something which is being overtaken as a, uh, as, as a function should be led by operations and supply chain separately. And then we get into the, the core domain of marketing, which is managing the customers. But how do you manage the customers in, in an era of dynamic uh, loyalty? Where, which, which is kind of moving on a second to second basis, uh, which is being tracked through digital technologies. So the reality is that the marketing function, as we knew it, as we have called it out historically, as Prof. Porter so eloquently called out in the form of the four P's, or even as Michael Porter called out, as Prof. Kotler and Michael Porter both called out, that is no longer how it used to be. And unless and until we change our lenses of looking at it, we are living in a very, very troubled world as far as marketeers are concerned. Continuous executive surveys seem to suggest that the tenure of the CMO is perhaps the lowest amongst all executives. A point which was highlighted by the Harvard Business Review with a special edition in 2007, when they bought the spotlight on the trouble with the CMOs. And the reason it's happening is because businesses in this era of disruption are under serious financial pressure. There is a shift in terms of the classical channel definition. There is a huge level of customer consolidation where it, where, where it then becomes, and I was myself and, and during my Unilever days, at the crux of it, when we were shifting from the days where we had to go out to the hundreds and thousands of small mom and pop Kirana stores into the 
initial days of big organized retail coming into play. And from there now into the digital era, when you're having the social e-commerce ventures like Pinduoduo developing much better than what, what perhaps Groupon did. But the fact is that there is much more consolidation of customer power and the customer is not one who listens to you, but she has a voice of her own. Now, while all this is happening, there is an inability on marketing's part to measure across so many medium which are all operating in a real time and dynamic manner. So what is the outcome? The easy one, which is reduction in marketing expense and the one which I alluded to, the critical elements of the business, which used to be under the domain of marketing are now slowly shifting into other departments with the sense that the so-called marketing skills are skills which are now getting housed under other functions within the organization. Now, in, the, in this scenario, the general guidance which has been given to CMOs is measure marketing productivity, try to call out the long term versus the short term, and drive the brand equity further. In fact, the big consultants have looked at it in terms of a much more wider perspective, but then that's what is the luxury of the consulting fraternity. McKinsey has gone on to define marketing as, or the role of the CMO as the ability to harness the full capabilities of the business to provide the best experience for the customer and thereby drive growth. I tried reading it a few times and then I gave up because I couldn't really make out what it means. Bain went further and called out three archetypes for CMOs. The creative iconoclast, the professional general manager, and the digital wizard. And that immediately brought in front of my mind the visions of the polymath or Da Vinci or Gulliver. And then Spencer Stewart, the, the one agency which has been calling out that trouble under the CMO, went out and listed 10 critical characteristics for CMOs to have. You could read through these if you feel like, but I couldn't think of anything else left in order to define God. So the fact is our solution is to expect this person to be able to do everything. I humbly would like to state that we need to look at it a bit differently. And therefore what I'm calling out is that the evolution of marketing is not what the naysayers are calling it out. In 2005, MIT Sloan had basically called out an article which said that the marketing competence is declining and getting dispersed. The same point which I made a few minutes ago. Forbes, in fact, went on to have this really eye-catching title, is marketing dead? And Harvard Business Review obviously started analyzing and saying why CMOs never last. So I went back to the point which this troubled colleague was making when he asked me this question a few weeks ago. And he asked, is this the end of marketing? But what I would like to humbly submit is this is not the end of marketing. And instead, what as marketeers we need to talk about is not marketing in the age of disruption, but the fact that marketing itself is getting disrupted. And let me emphasize why I say this. I've been a student of disruption and technology innovation for the better part of the past two decades, having been in the midst of a few major disruptions myself. And if I look at the current state of marketing, I can identify very clear disruption signals over there. I talked about the narrowing of roles and relevance, which means that there's a diffusion of boundaries. We talked about marketing expertise moving on to other departments, but that's a classic case of an ecosystem rather than a narrow industry taking over a particular domain. Marketing today no longer has integrated solutions. Instead, you reach out to a gazillion different agencies, which basically signifies modularity, a classic uh, signal of moving into a digital world. 
And today you no longer talk about your agencies and your vendors, etc. But there's much more talk about working together and co-creating the overall value. Yes, there is commoditization of services, but that's a natural offshoot of the fact that in a disrupted world, we come across lack of differentiation. So, yes, the point I would like to make is that marketing is the one which is getting disrupted. And the best way of calling it out is what I call as the three D's of disruption. There is dematerialization. A lot of stuff which we did physically is marketing is now moving on to the digital format. There is disintermediation. There's lesser number of middlemen. We can use Google or Facebook directly in terms of, and they can help us creating our campaigns. And yes, indeed, there is disaggregation. There are different set of partners who are coming in in order to deliver the entire marketing solution. You know, the Dawn Draper era of I will do your entire marketing campaign no longer works. And those of us who are marketeers ourselves right now know that you are working with a much wider cross section of partners, if I might call them, than what I did 30 years ago when I was a marketeer myself in a company. However, even though marketing is disrupted, I believe this could be the golden age of marketing. And the reason I say so is because all disruptions have two sides to it. If you look at it today, the overall arenas of marketing have changed considerably. One of the biggest brands which we have built over the past decade is the Indian Premier League. It's a $7 billion brand built in sports. Politics today is all about marketing. Even religion is being, evangelism is one of the biggest forms of marketing. You run an institute yourself and you know you have to market uh, yourself, otherwise it doesn't work, as are all educational institutions doing. Movies are being marketed, social causes are being marketed. Even Environment needs to be marketed. Companies are not looking at consumers and customers they will market to. In fact, the bigger challenge for many companies in today's era, when, when employee retention is a big, big challenge, is how do we market ourselves to prospective employees? So the fact is that the arenas in which marketing used to play has grown considerably from the era of what Professor Kotler defined in terms of what the domain of marketing would be. Even, even places have to be marketed. The government of India recently called out a, a $10 billion plan to market the Lakshadweep Islands. So when this is happening, the point really is that, yes, the marketing function is getting dissipated and you could see it as a low light, but I would instead call it as a highlight because across the organization, what we are seeing is a much, much wider prevalence of marketing. And therefore, we should look at it as a great oh, signal because marketing, when it stretches to other functions, it actually strengthens the role of marketing. So in this context, what I would like to do is humbly submit that there's need for us to relook at what marketing professionals, marketing students, and marketing researchers and us academics in this field need to look at. You know, and, and if you go back to what has been the focus of marketing research and what the Marketing Science Institute has been one of the uh, benchmark setters for this, right from the days when they said the PIM study, the profit in, uh, impact on strategy for marketing in the 70s or market orientation in the early 80s, or even moving on to the service dominant logic as, as a goal for marketing, or looking into measuring brand equity, which happened about 20 odd years ago. And then for the past 10, 15 years, we have been talking about new technologies and MarTech and relationship marketing. But recently, the point which I'm making has to some extent even been addressed by MSI, because they have called out that it's important for us to look at how does marketing organize itself for agility in this VUCA world, which you called out from Sadas. So therefore, the four pointers which I would like to leave today's audience with is marketing needs to move beyond the function. We as marketing researchers need to look at marketing as from an organizational standpoint and not as a functional standpoint. Marketing needs to own the concept and we need to own the concept after unshackling it from the function and the domain. 
it's the marketing in the organization which we need to really study about. Marketing can also use this opportunity to be the cradle for nurturing new skills and technologies. A lot of what we need to do in order to win in this disrupted world is going to be interfunctional simply because the definitions of functions remain hooked onto the previous era. Look at all our institutions. We are still organized in terms of marketing, in terms of finance, in terms of economics, in terms of organizational behavior, and in terms of strategy. And then we have something called information systems. Where does a platform business really reside? Where does understanding consumer behavior reside? Why isn't it a human sciences as much as a marketing domain? So the fact is most of interesting open questions in today's world are interdepartmental simply because the functional boundaries which we are living with is a, is a construct of the past. So therefore, we need to use that as an opportunity to deconstruct it and finally, what I would like to call out as the most important aspect, marketing needs to basically open itself up to driving the marketing culture and being the owner of it. David Packard, the founder of Hewlett Packard, many decades ago had said, marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department. But at the same time, Peter Drucker had also said, if business has one function, it's the function of marketing. So what I would like to end with is say that marketing remains more important than ever before. This indeed is the golden age if we are able to accept, acknowledge, and operate in the new and wider domain of what marketing is about. So thank you for this opportunity again. And I would like to leave you with these thoughts. Uh, and I'm sure it will be addressed in the coming uh, discussions also. Thank you. Professor Malia, you are on mute. Uh, Professor Malia, please unmute. So, uh, thank you, Professor Bagri, for the insightful address. Now I call upon Mr. Farhan, Executive Director of Shanghai Business Consulting Company, China, for his keynote address. Over to Mr. Farhan. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't agree more with um, more what uh, most what was um, said um, from um, the um, speakers before me. Um, what I'm, I'm super impressed is um, the positive take on. Um, uh, disruption and um, uh, what does it um, uh, mean um, uh, for us right as marketers um, and um, that's actually the theme of um, my little um, address to um, all of you um, I want to point your view um, uh, to the theme that's usually not very prominent right um, how um, uh, something like COVID-19 as bad and um, ugly it has been um, had its positive effects on um, marketing itself and on um, marketing um, uh, consulting, right? Um, as said earlier, um, uh, I'm running my own um, consultancy, strategy consultancy in Shanghai, which is called Hülle. And Hülle uh, loosely translates into um, uh, rethinking. And I think that's the big thing with um, disruptions, right? They force us to rethink the things um, we did. And um, that's something that has um, a very big value um, for all um, our doing, right? Um, the first job I did 20 years ago was in an agency that called themselves um, uh, the disruption company nowadays. And um, I think that's why I might have um, a more positive um, view on disruptions than uh, most of the um, uh, people, right? Um, what I always think um, or say when it comes to disruption and um, how to look at it is that it is an accelerator of change that would have happened anyway, right? Um, uh, a lot of change um, goes slowly, slowly, slowly up to a point where um, a disruption takes place and that accelerates it. And this comes with um, a lot of inconveniences. We all know this, right? But it also comes with a lot of um, opportunities. And that's, um, I guess, the good point about um, a disruption. Um, if you look at China, right, and um, uh, a lot of people admire what has happened um, over the last um, uh, 
20 or so um, years with the digital ecosystem in China, right? That um, it is much more developed than um, in most of the Western countries, that um, the integration of social and e-commerce is something that um, uh, is uncomparable to what um, we know um, in the West, right? Um, but this actually came as consequence of a disruption of the first COVID virus, right? Um, because SARS was it that um, let everybody or yeah, forced everybody at that time, 2002, to um, deep dive into e-commerce, to um, uh, go and um, give deliver delivery services. And um, all these kind of things um, made what now is this admirable e-commerce system um, in China, right? And um, that's why I looked um, at um, our experiences with our clients and beyond um, with COVID-19 and what are the um, positive um, uh, um, effects um, it had on um, our clients' marketing and our business as um, marketing um, consultants, right? And um, uh, I want to share six of them. I, I don't think that is um, a conclusive list. There are most likely a lot more, but um, let's um, uh, keep um, uh, those um, six for the um, uh, 10, 15 minutes um, I have. So the first um, uh, thing is, if you look at it, it's almost a no-brainer, right? Um, COVID-19 pushed the fast forward button on digital, digital transformation. I think that's um, very clear for all of us. The workplace, the physical workplace did not exist for um, a while. and almost everything, internal communication, um, uh, contacts to customers, managing supply chain, um, had to be digital, uh, digitalized, right? And um, uh, most companies had this um, planned anyway, but most likely not for days and weeks, but months and um, years. So you see that um, uh, this um, digital transformation um, got accelerated um, quite heavily um, uh, by um, uh, COVID-19. Um, um, the second thing, and um, that might um, sound a little bit schizophrenic, but it is the case, um, uh, COVID-19 provided actually a chance, companies with a chance, or the perfect opportunity to innovate, right? Because if you look at it, um, most of the um, uh, most of um, uh, the consumers were much more forgiving, right? Um, they knew that um, companies have to try new things um, in this um, uh, um, new times. And um, that gave um, a lot of businesses the opportunity to experiment, to introduce new products, to explore new ways, uh, new ways of customer services. And they met much less resistance than they might have met um, before. And a lot of companies made um, in this period of, um, yeah, instant innovation, if you like, be it services, products, business models, um, uh, this experience that um, you can integrate change and um, uh, disruption into your business model. So um, uh, that's um, uh, my second um, learning, right, um, that um, uh, we, this COVID-19, had a lot of opportunities to innovate and this will keep here. Um, the third point is, and um, we heard it um, a little bit um, uh, when it came to plant purpose and um, uh, plant reputation, um, COVID-19 actually gave a lot of plants the chance to boost their reputation, right? Um, there is a study from the um, uh, Chartered Institute of Marketing um, uh, which asked um, uh, CMOs um, uh, what they believed um, they, uh, their um, COVID-19 communication and response um, had um, done in the market. And 71% of them said, um, yeah, I think it has boosted the reputation of um, their plant, right? And um, you can see it, plant purpose starts to play a bigger and bigger role. And it's more than just the marketing talk um, of CMOs that um, uh, might sound irrelevant to the CFO or the CEO. Um, uh, it is a talk that even um, investors and um, shareholders um, now talk and walk, right? Um, Plexstone, for instance, is saying they won't invest anymore into businesses that don't have a very clear um, brand um, uh, purpose. So this um, third point, if you want, um, COVID-19 helped us marketers to, um, uh, yeah, talk about the relevance of the brand and um, boost brand reputation. Uh, a fourth point um, which um, brings us closer to the business of marketing consulting so is 
that COVID-19 highlighted the uh, importance of training and upskilling, right? Um, we talk a lot about it, um, especially um, as um, people that um, try to educate young people and to teach young people and to mentor um, young people. Um, companies also talk a lot about it, but the reality um, always looks um, a little bit different. And um, nowadays, um, this, um, the learnings um, in this um, time of COVID where everybody said, okay, um, people have to um, understand how digital works. They have to, um, uh, we have to do something better for their well-being. Um, companies start um, uh, adapting this and um, trying to build new training programs, which is a good thing for um, marketing consulting, right? Um, last, no, not the last um, point before, um, last point, and um, we heard it um, earlier when it was um, talked about um, changing from a supplier to a co-creation um, relationship. Um, what um, COVID-19 did was um, to um, uh, let the contact between clients and their um, marketing agencies um, rise, right? Um, clients and um, agencies, um, consultancies um, moved closer together. There is um, another report um, uh, from um, APRAISE um, that looked at um, how often um, uh, global clients contacted their agencies um, during um, uh, COVID and um, how often um, agencies um, uh, contacted their clients um, during COVID. And um, what you can see is that um, the um, contact um, frequency was up by um, 20% for um, con um, the clients contacting their agencies and by even um, uh, uh, fifty percent um the other way around. So and um as we all know, more contact also means um um a, a chance to deepen um a relationship. Something that especially agencies that um are um she's to um uh, become irrelevant um uh, had um to make a good hands off. So and um the last point and I think that's um most likely um the biggest um. Uh, uh, positive disruption for um, the marketing consultancy business is um, uh, the possibility to work um, remotely gave a lot of um, young, talented people the opportunity to prove themselves outside of the borders of the um, traditional corporate world, right? Um, more and more young people um, challenge this assumption that they have to go into a corporation, have to do um, a corporate job, um, or even have to go into a consultancy. A lot of young people with um, their talents um, uh, say, well, why not trying to um, do freelance um, business? And this opens a huge pool of talented um, people that um, consultancy like ours can um, build their corporation um, network, um, no matter where we are located and no matter where um, those talents um, are located. So this is basically my take on um, six um, uh, important um, positive impacts um, that um, we have seen and that um, are here to um, stay. Fast forward on digital um, transformation, the opportunity to innovate and um, build change into your business model, um, the chance for um, reputation boost and um, the importance of um, brand um, purpose, um, uh, the importance of training within um, uh, the corporate world, closer client contact, and more and better talent available for um, uh, us and our consultancy business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Falk. Now I call upon uh, Dr. Vinay Shilgautam, Vice Chairman, Food School of Management for his session. Thank you, Professor Bandapadhyay. Uh, being the sixth stroke, seventh speaker in a series discussing the issues of uh, marketing in a disrupted world. I was trying to position my remarks uh, in a sequential manner so that there was no repetition of the wisdom that has flowed without due acknowledgement of who has said what. And I turned to my own diary and a very interesting pattern emerged. Last evening, I was at the inaugural of a program, International, on strategies for an agile work culture, pathways to new age. Today, I'm at the inaugural of a, a program on marketing in a, a disrupted world, 
and on fourth, I have to be at the inaugural of another international launch of creativity, collaboration, coaching, the way forward. The organizations involved are IFTDO, FOR, and RTDO International. And I considered it totally fortuitous that the three themes integrate well with each other, with no common audiences, so I can do the potpourri of one to the other and mix it up to deliver what I think may be 10 minutes worth of your time, having covered already in sequence relevance uh, of marketing in a disrupted world on education, then considerations of customer consolidation, growth of marketing, age of disruption, and marketing itself getting disrupted to the last speaker talking of integrating change. I don't intend this as a summary, but I do see it as a testimony of my literacy to have understood to a limited extent all the wisdom that has flowed and I'll leave it to Dr. J.K. Das to distill it as he goes along. And I visualize, knowing his work method, a book under his editorship on dealing with this theme not very long ago. I use this occasion to extend my personal welcome to the moving spirit of four, that is Dr. B.B. Al Madhukar, who has just surfaced on the screen, and the program is made the brighter. And I will take shelter under his benign umbrella just in case you fault me for anything which I'm going to say. Now, what is it that I want to say in 10 minutes, which I think may be taking forward the line of thought which has been disrupt disrupted, integrated, put together in a consolidated manner. The first thought is, as Dr. Das rightly pointed out, disruption is nothing new. We talk of disruption because it, it is our personal experience, but that's another story. What I want to tell you is the following. Disruption is not always a negative word. And my research staff take, keeps me on my toes by constantly doing a periodic review of what has gone on. And let me tell you what I have understood of the marketing experience in the disrupted world in the first phase of uh, COVID experience in India. And if you look at the rural economy of which one hears so much in the press these days that even the powers that run this country pass a bill, then take it back, and they say this is a big strategic move. And I'm, I'm still trying to make a sense out, out of this strategy, but that's not my job. What I found was the rural economy in the first phase of uh, the pandemic experience in India actually underwent at least four experiences. There was technological upgradation. There was development of the commercial channels. The low ticket electronic items became essential commodities and mobile phones moved to the center stage. If, this, if at all this was a disruption, it was a disruption in the positive direction. Not only was that so, but there was 3.6% growth of the economy. Now, if this is disruption, then surely there is no negative meaning in that disruption. The second phase, however, was different because there was a two-speed economy. Whereas one sector, the rural sector was flourishing, the second sector, which was the urban sector, was floundering. Now, if I had more time, and alas, human experience is always lamenting limitations of time, I would have more things to say it in, but the art lies in saying what you want to say within the limited time available to you. And therefore, my second submission is, it is a very gated experience to generalize it beyond the point, maybe oversimplification, and I'm sure under the leadership of the director, the coming few discussions, which which cover a very large set of topics. I was going through the sub-themes from consumer experience and behavior to consumers, product, technology, sales, distribution, and services. Nothing seems to have been left. And there are a barrage of papers, a spate of discussions will follow, and I'm sure we will be at the end of it wiser than we were, what we were at the beginning of it. But I set out to 
submitted to you five concerns of which I've already submitted one. Namely, let's not generalize beyond the point. These generalizations are facetious to say the least, and we'll have to understand disruption in its many variegated hues. My second submission is, the health crisis and the economic crisis has got intertwined. And my interface between the health crisis and the economic crisis is, economic crisis has reduced the resources available to meet the health crisis. So somewhere the disruptions in the market have challenged the regulatory function. And if you see jerks and jolts, it is because the governance of the civil society is unable to have enough predictive validity. Now, what do I mean by saying the governance of the civil society has not shown enough resilience to have predictive validity? It is because the data is not available. And the classical method we adopt in research of comparisons of similar experiences in the past is not available. So we are fiddling with wires in the dark, and that is what makes the disruption in the market such a tricky thing to deal with. This crisis, to my mind, will be only resolved over time because there are few precedences of this scale of change over this range of economic experience. My third submission to you is the choices of the Indian strategy are limited because as the internal choices get their strange overtones, regional cooperation in South Asia is very limited. One of the many hats I wear one of them has been blue ocean studies. And if you look at the comp comparative cooperation amongst the BIMSTEC countries, which would cover Myanmar, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and what have you, the actual economic cooperation is very limited. Therefore, strategic choices will get very limited. And therefore, disruption is a major challenge to policy cohesion. My third submission is therefore complete, and I would like to go on to my fourth submission, which is very simply, we will have to understand new categories of economic segregation. Rural is no longer rural in a classical sense. There is a continuum from the rural to the urban. And this is where I think research and responsibilities of academics come in, especially in a field like marketing, clarification on categories. We have to recognize that experience has been traded for efficiency. Our experiences were with grocery shopping, doctor's consultation, there has been an online shift with that, and that's genuine disruption. Our new methods of coping are not on to speed. Therefore, to me, technology is the biggest enabler, and this is a fit way of responding to one of the biggest disruptions of human history. I would like to wind up within the limitations of the time allotted to me because I do feel myself sufficiently old-fashioned to say, yes, going all over may be fashionable, but discipline is also as old as the seas. And I would like to be on the side of the organizers to make sure they are able to do what they set out to do with some disciplined manner, because that's the only way I know of getting to a destination. What I would submit, therefore, is the need to look at expenses, education-related, because remember, debts are blocked in mobility. And I would refer to my experiences in consulting for banks, including the Reserve Bank, to say they have to begin understanding the reason 
which is leading to indebtedness, which is blocking mobility, which is the driving force in Indian sociology. Everyone is wanting to better his situation. And as the resources dry up because of the economic situation and the health crisis, debt is becoming far more endemic. And if I had the opportunity, I would have shared with you the data. I'd like to conclude there today and now, not because it is the conclusion of what I have to say, but what I have to say will be taken forward by better people, stronger deliberations, and in that hope, I'm happy to conclude my remarks, and I look forward to how this program will flow, because at the end of it, like many things which Paul does, it will be a definite contribution to the expanse of knowledge and the attempt to keep frontiers forward, which is what our fellowship in four is all about. Thank you so much, Dr. Das, for the opportunity to unburden my thoughts with such a distinguished set of colleagues and an audience to follow. I will look forward to the results. Thank you, Dr. Madhukar, for helping such activities and related activities to keep growing, which is, I think, the nature of four over to Nirmalya, and with thanks for all that he has done to make this program shape up the way it looks like shaping up. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your insightful address. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, request our honorable chairman, uh, Dr. BBL Madhukar, to address the audience. Thank you. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Dr. Nirmala Bandapadhyay, Dr. Das, and distinguished vice chairman of Four School, Dr. Vinayashil Gautam, and and learned speakers and participants. It's a very great day today that we are consider we are discussing a topic which is of great vital interest to the entire business world. And business affects every walk of life. Every society is largely dependent on how the business goes on in all spheres of life. But however, you know, talking about the disruption part of the pandemic which has happened, yes, the disruption has taken very deeply. We have lost many tenants, many people. The loss of human life has been terrible and very, very tragic. At the same time, you know, well, not uh, not not giving much uh, regard to that aspect now that we are on a different topic altogether. We find that in the realm of marketing, there is a change in customer behavior. And this behavior has not taken long, long years. Normally, a change in attitude or behavior of any human species would take many, many years. But in this case, as the pandemic took place, it came almost like somebody invading you and invading the entire world in very many ways. And one such thing was that, you know, it driven it drove us to a disparate digital revolution. Digitalization was a good thing. But digitalization would happen that soon, that fast. This was a miracle. Because people were forced by circumstances that they will not go physically to any store or any shopping area because they have the fear of coronavirus touching them. So they wanted everything to be done remotely through the digital mode and the digital world was ready to accept it. And the digital stores led by many e-commerce companies like Amazon and, uh, and so on they have flourished in this period, and people once got used to this behavior that they found there's a lot of merit and wisdom in doing that. Because you could order a thing from home and get the thing delivered to your home. This was something unusual. People, even the women, you know, is quite have been quite used to shopping themselves. They enjoy shopping. They enjoy physical, physically going, visiting a store, and then they enjoy picking up anything of their choice. But this has been limited to a great extent. 
But now today they have their choices also available to them through the digital mode. But this this behavioral change has come about for the good of the world in a way. The changes that change has led us to adoption of digital way of shopping. Change the old method of old mode old tradition of physical stores in just about eight weeks' time, the whole world changed. Such rapid change was unexpected or imaginably fast. E-commerce is more efficient. I'm talking about the good aspect of the pandemic. What it has resulted and given to the world is that e-commerce is far more efficient. It is less expensive. There's a lot of possibility of reduced costs because the intermediaries get eliminated to get a strength. The bazaars and the shop, shops are no longer required, no longer in demand. The rentals have gone, gone down considerably and even the shops are getting closed. That is leading to loss of employment for many people. But it is giving rise to another kind of story. Like, you know, like Professor Vinayashil has said, that there was 3.5 percent growth registered in this period. If the disruption was there, normally a growth is not expected in a normal situation. This was unusual. What is unusual now after disruption is that the, previously it was a luxury that somebody is allowed to work from home because the nature of the job required that they could work from home as efficiently as they could be in the office. Today, the world is different. You are not only allowed to work from home, but also allowed to work from anywhere in the world. Wherever you are, you can continue to work that way. And you could be in Tanzania and doing, working for a company in Canada, Canada, that's possible. That world, whole world has become your marketplace for employees and for people who are talented. They get a much wider world. They're the best of both the worlds. While they enjoy the same kind of life which they have been enjoying in his home and the life which they would have otherwise enjoyed working in some other country. So that whole world has become one, particularly for talented people who are skilled people and they also have a good medium of communication, like English has come about as a language of the commercial world. So if you have learned English, you can communicate with people from different parts of the world and you can market anything, including your talent, including your skill, including everything that good, good things that you possess, there is a market for it in all parts of the world. Previously, before the pandemic, the markets were limited, physically and virtually also. But today, in the virtual world, things are totally different and lots of good things have come about. But I would say that, no, this is not just the digital transformation taking place, but at the same time, lots of work is coming down, coming to all the developing countries, particularly I'm talking in the context of India, gaining immensely from this change, which has, brought, which has come, out, come as an aftermath of pandemic. Indians, Indian students are known to be very talented and the skill they are acquiring like no, nobody else in the world. They are acquiring very fast. And both the skill as well as communication, ability of English language and other things also. And I'm sure that Indians will succeed in getting a very good chunk of the world, uh, world, 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 business, world business. So I'm sure that let us look at the positive side of the whole tariff story, the bad and the painful side we have, we have seen already. Now we have partly or almost fully recovered. As far as India is concerned, we almost feel like the normal days have come about and people have started frequent, frequenting places. But the shopping still remains at a low key. The physical shopping, digital shopping is going on by any means, you know, galloping rate. So these things have come in the form of both good and bad things in life. Let's take the good, good things that have emerged and I'm sure that there might, might be a a, a, a kind of a, uh, what you call, uh, the, as we do in case of football or hockey or cricket, 
their teams are sold and they are possessed as a way of mere, mere creation of wealth. So there will be team, uh, teams made of, as I said, a pool. You know, a pool, somebody will keep, keep A pool or B pool or C pool, and that will be traded all over the world. You know, it will be trading of talented people all across the world, boundaries and of the world. So therefore, you know, let's look at the positive side of it and then try to make the best out of it. I'm so, I compliment both, the, both Professor Das, who has been the person to, to organize all these things, including, of course, uh, the main uh, person who is doing this event, Professor Nirvana Bhattamantapadhyaya. I compliment all of them so that this opportunity of expressing ourselves or at least making ourselves, uh, you know, uh, expressing ourselves about the changes which has come about and seeing also the greater side of it was the opportunity given to me. I'm so thankful and I wish the, this whole conference extremely successful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your address. May I now call upon uh, Professor Ansh Gupta to give vote of thanks and conclude. Over to Professor Ansh Gupta. Professor Nirmalya, uh, thank you so much for uh, the words of wisdom that has been shared by the panelists. I would like to uh, quote Peter Drucker over here, which is a classical quote in marketing. We all of us have read this. The aim of marketing is to know and understand the customers so well that product and services fit him or her and sells itself. That's it's all about understanding the customer. And we have to go back to the basics. We have to go back to the drawing boards to understand how the customers are changing in this disrupted world. The scholars and practitioners from around the world will join us over these two days, today and tomorrow in this conference to share their thoughts and lead the way forward for the marketers in this disrupted world. As we are discussing right now, we have about 280 participants live hearing all of us. It has been a wonderful uh, inaugural session. I would like to thank uh, 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 I would like to thank uh, uh, our special guest uh, uh, who could not join us, uh, Dr. Shrikar Reddy and uh, Mr. Khan on his behalf who spoke. Then I would like to thank uh, Dr. Madhukar for the words of wisdom shared with us, Dr. Vinashil Gautam for sharing his thoughts on the topic. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jitendra Das for uh, guiding us throughout the organizing this conference and helping us through getting all the uh, arrangements done. Then I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Osama Khan for the ideas that he shared about destructuring and rethinking about the way marketing has been taught and the overall education system. Professor Prakash Bagri for looking at positive light in this whole disrupted thing. It's not the end of the marketing, it's a new era that is getting on. And then Mr. Falk for uh, telling us that it's not the end of the world. We are looking at a brighter side. Thank you so much. Thanks all. We look forward for the papers that we have. And thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Thank you all.